If we can uh, <laughs> shift gears for a minute, though, because uh, I know that you're a big science communicator online. That you are actively engaged in you know, Twitter and uh, blogging and all of the social media aspects that we, we all do as well. And we're very much interested in that. Um, Lauren is a science communicator and so on. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, you'd like to share with the audience, or like what your goals are for that in terms of your work and how you feel it's helped. Yeah. So interestingly, when I first started Twitter, which was about a year and a half, maybe two years ago at this point, I I thought that it would be a really good way to do outreach with the public, um, and it it turned out to be less that. Although I do have a number of sort of just general followers, um, and has turned more into being a way for me to network with other scientists like all of you guys whom I would never have met without Twitter um, and uh, and also science journalists and communicators which has been a really interesting um, whole it's opened up a whole different set of, of conversations and <clears throat> I used to be very anti Twitter and so now like many people who used to be against something and are now for it, I, I can get a little excited and be a little evangelical. Um, so I'll try to rein it in. But uh, I just, I find it, I found it so useful just from a professional development perspective in terms of being able to get advice very quickly. Um, I, uh, to demonstrate this, I, I, I visited the National Science Foundation in October uh, and talked to them about using social media to promote conversations. And to demonstrate the power of Twitter, I started a hashtag at like 10 o'clock at night um, called First Grant and said, hey, do you guys have any advice for someone writing their first grant? Please tweet to First Grant. And then over the next 48 hours was just getting a constant stream of advice from people. Just very, just instantly the conversation started. And so I use this as an example to show the folks at NSF, like, look, you know, you, you can generate a conversation very quickly that actually has really useful, meaningful information, even though it's only 140 characters. Um, I'm able to get help with R really quickly um, and statistics and uh, so, so, so from a selfish perspective, you know, you can, you can actually save yourself quite a bit of time um, just because, you know, really great crowdsourced content, like important blog posts, important uh, papers kind of come to you. At the same time, in order to cultivate those relationships and the kind of followers that, um, that will make that that happen, you also need to be able to give back, right, as well. You can't just necessarily be a taker when it comes to social media. Um, and so, yeah, so I found, uh, I found it to be really interesting. And also, from the science communications perspective, as a scientist, I feel as though I, as a publicly funded scientist in particular, I have an obligation to, um, to make my work accessible to the public. And part of that involves just being open and available, but also part of that involves participating in conversations with science communicators about what the future of science communication should look like. Because science communicators are often you know, the go-between between between me and the public, or they're sort of the, they create the opportunities for me to share my work with the public. And so in order to have that, that process be as meaningful as possible, it's really, really important for me as a scientist and for all of us as scientists to be participating with science communicators in these conversations about, you know, open science, about, um, you know, what's your science writing look like? How do we get away from this reporting, um, the paper of the week from one of the big three journals um, and into more context-driven, deeper um, uh, kinds of stories that represent the process of science? And so I would say that's another big, um, another big theme. And then another one is just um, uh, reaching out to and creating a space for community. So I've networked with a lot of women in science in particular and have found that it's just a really nice way, especially if you're, you know, for, I know a number of people who are isolated at their institutions. They might be the only, you know, they might be the only biologist or they might be the only ecologist um, at their, at their small university or they might be in a department where they don't really have a lot of women, for example, or people of color. And so Twitter can be an incredible way to, um, to get you connected really quickly with 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 different communities and um, have meaningful interactions um, and, and sort of peer support. Jacqueline, just uh, when you were talking about, I know that you're really interested in women in science, um, and you've written an excellent post on imposter syndrome. And I know a lot of people find that really useful. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe say a little bit about that, um, if any of our listeners are 
experience in that and how you dealt with it? Yeah, so um, I it, it took me a really long time, as, as I'm sure it does to many people, to realize that imposter syndrome was a thing. Um, when I got to grad school, I thought that everyone around me was more together, more capable, you know, better had a better background. I had never taken a college math class. Um, I started off with a humanities sort of focus and then moved into science and then went to a, kind of an alternative, like a more of a progressive college. I, I, was a, I did my undergrad at College of the Atlantic um, where there's no sort of set curriculum. I basically did the equivalent of changing majors halfway through, um, but I was able to do it in four years because it's a liberal arts institution. Um, I think that makes me a very... I think that's that's made me a stronger scientist than I would have been otherwise. But I got into grad school never having taken calculus, um, you know, having very little stats background, and all I could think of was all these people are smarter than me. They're more they're more capable. They're more together. Um, but I and and someone will find me out. Right? They will figure out that they have made a mistake and they should not have admitted me. And then everyone will know, and I'll be outed to everyone. But what I didn't know is that everyone else you know, you go to these orientation events or whatever, you're sitting in a seminar, everyone else is thinking the exact same thing. And nobody wants to talk about it because they think everyone else in the room is more together than them or, you know, what, you know, et cetera. And so there are conversations that we just don't have with each other as peers because we're afraid of sounding foolish. And, you know, unless you're unless your advisor or a mentor or someone someone tells you that this is a completely normal feeling. Um, you, you have no way of knowing. And it really took me until I was until I was like halfway through my PhD before I realized that I had I had gained this incredible body of knowledge and um, and uh, and research tools and was able to really feel as though I'd accomplished something. And uh, and I think for me mentoring became a really important part of getting over um, my imposter syndrome. And and the other thing I should say is that it's kind of like a sine wave, right? It, it comes back. So I, you know, as a PhD student, finally I was feeling really confident. And then as a postdoc, I felt it a little bit. And as a, you know, future faculty member, I'm starting to feel like, oh, you know, these, these imposter syndromes feeling, the imposter syndrome feelings kind of creeping back up again. Um, but I think the way in which it interfaces with, for example, women in science is that if you don't see a lot of people like you in the group, or um, with something like the leaky pipeline, if you watch the other women in your program sort of dropping out at different stages uh, and, and you, the, the representation of other people like you getting smaller through time, then you're, you're more likely to feel like an imposter, right? Because you literally are the only person, you might be the only person in the room who is, um, who is like you. And then it's, I think it's, if you don't have the right kind of mentoring, it can be very alienating. Um, and I was very lucky to have good mentors, but for me, um, getting over my imposter syndrome eventually became a matter of sort of almost like social justice or, or activism because I felt like, you know, you need to like get over this because, you know, women are, are socialized to not be assertive, to not be confident, um, to, to not, and, and to not own our own accomplishments, right? Women are socialized to say things like, oh, I had help or, oh, I was lucky. Um, and so, for me, you know, owning up to the things that I had accomplished was a big part of getting over my imposter syndrome um, and admitting that, yes, I, I do deserve to be here. I did earn, you know, every every accomplishment that I've had. And um, it's not an accident and no one's going to kick me out of science because I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> so I can sympathize with some of that. I mean, I'm a, a theoretical biologist who's never actually taken a formal course in biology. <laughs> so... Maybe, um, maybe I shouldn't admit that on air. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, added my, I added myself as not ever having taken calculus, so. Do you That's think right. that we just have to draw this math to Steve anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's a particular problem for women in science because of institutionalized sexism? Do you think that's still a major issue? And if so, what can be done about it? I know you were involved quite heavily in the response to Women's Space, the article published by Nature. Yeah. Um, so just if you want to say a little bit about that. Um, yeah. Um, and for, 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 for those, those who don't know, I urge you to, to just Google the word Women's Space um, because there was a, 
a, a, sh a short piece of short fiction that was published in Nature that relied heavily on stereotypes of, of women as sort of gatherers or as shoppers, you know, people who had this oh, yeah. inherent knowledge about domesticity. Um, and it was, to me, to this day, as, as a science fiction fan, to this day I still have no idea why they would publish something that was so offensive and also not great science, not, not great fiction when there's so much really good science fiction. I know so many starving science fiction writers out there, right? And like, they, they'd, be, they'd be great um, for nature futures. But so I, I think that to me is a really good example of, of institutionalized sexism, right? People think of sexism as in this very old school way sometimes where it's your boss grabbing your ass as you go through the hallway. And that does happen. You know, not to not to belittle those kinds of experiences. So what I think is actually much more prevalent is is not necessarily these overt examples, but this culture or in, what's called institutionalized sexism, where you have structural barriers to women being successful. For example, a tenure clock that doesn't necessarily mesh very well with a biological clock, or a lack of um, of support for parents, um, which since women tend to do the majority of of the of the labor in terms of you know domestic efforts, then that that disproportionately affects women, um, or things like like women's space, which create creates a culture that where, where women feel like they they are seen as um, you know purely domestic, right? They're not seen as equal colleagues or scientists, and it could be something as simple of, as you know it, there there have been plenty of studies that have come out that have shown that. Um, if you have, you know, the women are, um, more, are, are more, more likely to be given sort of, um, the, 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 the equivalent of domestic tasks in a department, for example, like you, you know, I would like you to organize the holiday party, or I would like you to, you know, to update the website or, you know, these sort these sorts of like secretarial kinds of tasks. And, and, and if you, I, I think overcoming these, in order to overcome these, you have to start by acknowledging that, that they're real and thinking about um, sort of being mindful, right? Like if, you, if you're a PI in a lab and you, you have a tendency to always ask the, um, the female grad students to organize the holiday party or to clean the lab, and I, and I know that this happens, <laughs> not, not in my lab, um, but you might just think about it. Be, be aware that you're doing that. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're at a meeting and you're, you know, you're always asking the female students to go to go make photocopies or get coffee for everyone. You know, those those are sort of ways in which these things can play out. I also think that there are real structural um, approaches, like uh, being really conscious about your hiring practices. Um, you know, thinking about the ways in which um, you, as someone who's organizing a symposium, can really make an effort to have good diversity. Um, but, but we also have to tackle it at the institutional level, where you have to advocate for Things like you know delayed tenure clocks and maternity support and paternity support. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's there's a lot of different structural elements. So it's sort of all the way from the you know the level of the institution or the university all the way down to you know individual behaviors. I think. Um, sure. Yeah. Sorry, that was kind of a botched answer, but I got a little thrown. No, off. that was that was really really good. No, uh, so we've got a we've got a late joiner here. Uh, <laughs> Bug, Bug has jumped in at the last minute. And, and so, totally screwed up your audio, sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, Bug, uh, Jacqueline, do you know Bug Girl? Uh, we, we've met at um, Science Online. Yes. Oh, excellent. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and Bug seems like she has something to say on this, so let's hear it, Bug. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Deep end. Three in. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I just... Uh, I'm sitting here nodding my head, but also at the same time being really kind of depressed that we're talking about this still. And when I was a grad student, we were having the same damn conversation. Um, and it's a little better. I mean, when I, when I look around at who, the, who I see as at professional meetings um, like Ecological Society, Entomological Society, it's not as bad as it was in the 80s when I would be the girl and there would be a few other of us um, and people would, would openly hit on you in the, in the bars. That was really obnoxious. Um, and 
so that's that's gotten better, but it's still we're still having the same conversation about how there is a leaky pipeline and people do drop out and people are treated differently. I mean, I'd be willing to bet not a single one of you guys has ever been asked if you are your secretary. Mm. But I get asked if I'm Dr. Bug Girl's secretary all the time. I mean, I, I just got a, so I put out a, a call for grad students and I had a couple of, of male prospective grad students refer to me as Miss or Mrs. Gill. Yes. Mm. Oh God, yes. I have a I have a PhD. You know, I might not be Professor Gill yet, but I'm definitely Doctor Gill. You know, and um, oh, and, and it's so frustrating when you'll be with a group of male colleagues, and they'll introduce people as Doctor Smith, Doctor Jones, Miss Bug Girl, and it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's um, a, and there, uh, I think part of the issue too is that as you know, unlike some of my colleagues in the humanities, as scientists, we don't get a lot of cultural competency training, and so it can be a bit <laughs> harder to um, to convince people um, that these things are are real issues, um, whether it's sexism or racism or some other um, sort of in intersection of social justice with, with science. Um, I'm sorry, I, I hate to play into that, but uh, cultural what now? Competency, co uh, co like you're competent or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, clearly I'm not competent, but yeah, it's, I, I, it's uh, C O M P E. Yeah. Um, think of it like em emotional intelligence is another yeah. way that people sometimes phrase it. Um, I've just never heard so, of training for this. I don't know what that. What does that entail? Please. Well, just I mean, as as scientists, we don't. If if you if you go through college and you and you and you take the bio track, right? You might never ever take a class on feminism or or um, or race in America, or um, you know, you just might not ever even be exposed to these ideas. And so I think that that contributes to this simplistic idea that I mentioned before, of where we think of as as you know, racism equals the KKK, um, you know, sexism equals the cigar chomping boss who you know pinches his mm -hmm. secretary, you know, things like that. And so. Um, one of the one of the, the the number one privilege that you get as someone who's a member of a privileged group is the ability to to not know that you have privilege or to forget that you have privilege right and so um so so there's a whole there's like a whole bunch of groundwork that you often have to do just to convince people that these are even important issues and one example is there was a um a colleague of mine at another institution who got a mid-semester review where the, the per, she asked for what she could do to help students learn better and the one student wrote teach naked and uh, yeah. and she yeah. addressed she and, and she didn't make any assumptions about whether that the person it was blind so she didn't make any assumptions about whether the person was male or female but she she thought about it and then she stood in front of the class and she said this is bullying this is not okay and people yeah. who don't speak up about this um, are complicit in bullying. So for those of you who giggled and thought it was funny um, afterwards, it's not okay. And you might think it's a compliment, and there's this thing is known as known as benevolent sexism, right? You might think you're paying someone a compliment, but actually it contributes to this broader culture of sexism. And um, and this person was actually called into a dean's office, not her dean, but another dean, and told that. Uh, by a female dean that it wasn't sexism and that she um, never she didn't understand why this person got these kinds of compliments but then again I don't look like you right and so this dean is already reinforcing this idea that people yep. who look a, women who look a certain way a woman dean is you know reinforcing this idea that people who look a certain way are um, you know should expect these kinds of statements and and was basically telling her it's not sexism she should get over it and mm. um, and maybe that it was her fault for not not being a better classroom manager so you know so again oh. sort of all these sort of Ooh. classic issues right so this is this is someone in a position of authority who in theory should have this kind of emotional intelligence or cultural competency training um, and just clearly does not right and so that at that level that's that's where you have a breakdown um, and a failure of, yeah. of the institution to support the woman faculty, who is now seen as a troublemaker, right? Um, yep. yep. That is, now she's, yeah, she's branded by male colleagues as a troublemaker. Yes. It, it, it's kind of, well, 
quote unquote interesting to 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 see these things because I mean that that to me at least that's that's when I feel most like the the Twitter echo chamber effect you know because I see like a, among my my scientist fellows on Twitter you know you see them all the time talking about these things and being very open and critical and aware you know and you get the impression that well you know this is something people are very aware of and there's they're 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 acting on it you know all the time and then you go to a meeting or you know you you see something like that happen at your institution or you just see some like inappropriate behavior at a conference and then you realize well maybe that that's not really that white as widespread as it appears by the, from the people that you talk about right and i mean yeah i mean all you need to do really is go to a to a conference to see these things it's, right and and we think and i think we think that you know scientists because you know we're you know we're educated we're often we're often liberal you know um, that we would get some of these other issues too like well, often you'll be like oh well, they get things like climate change and they get the environment and they get these other sort of aspects yeah. of our political identity but then they fail at things like gender or they fail at things like race and, and we haven't even talked about things like you know um, homophobia etc but I mean so I think yeah. women in science there's been more much more of a discussion as frustrating as it is than you know some of these other other kinds of social justice intersections but um, yeah and so I think actually one 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 important thing too is um, is is to have allies, right? That is, as frustrating as it mm -hmm. is having having allies, whether that's you know male allies or um, or you know for people of color to have white allies can be can be really important because as women it becomes really exhausting for us to have to do this work on top of all of our other work and the extra work of domesticity that we're often you know stuck with to to also do this social justice work and to try to completely to constantly educate our our, the male faculty and to constantly educate our male colleagues and, and over and over and over and over again with the same sort of issues come up um, it gets exhausting and so to, to have to be able to have a guy come in and say hey fellow guy that's not okay and this is why um, yeah. can actually be really helpful and a lot it's of guys hugely think, helpful yeah and a lot of guys have imposter syndrome right they think like I'm not qualified I don't know enough about feminism I can't I can't talk about these things um, but it's actually it's really really helpful. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I do sometimes like I, I think about these these things and you know I I mean it, it's an issue of concern, but I don't always know what to do about it, right? And you know I'm aware that I'm privileged and you know I'm in this position, and it constantly scares me that I'm you know doing something that I shouldn't be or that I'm ignoring something that I should be paying attention to. I don't know what to pay attention to. I don't know what actions to take. You know. Well, I would say the biggest thing you can do, and I say this as somebody that, um, so especially as a white woman that works in communities of colors a lot, it is really, really important to not stay silent. Because if you're in a group and someone says something really obnoxious, if you are quiet, they will assume that you agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important, just even, dude, that's not cool. You know, that, it doesn't have to be a well thought out philosophical statement with <laughs> citations about why it's not cool. But just, just being able to say, wait, I don't, I don't like that. I, I don't think you're behaving correctly. Let's let's rethink this, um, and I think there's a there's also a big difference between saying you are a racist, which will make everybody flip out, mm -hmm. and I think that thing that you said might be a little racist, mm -hmm. which is criticizing the words yeah. and not the person. Now the person may be an asshole racist, <laughs> but you're not going to get anywhere. And you're, and honestly, you can't ch really change pe people's be opinions. You can modify their behavior, and it's behavior modification that we're really after: is to to get people to think a little bit before they invite all guys to a symposium, and right. never really think about: have I remembered to not just invite people from my own personal friends? And uh, and also, yeah, if you look around. 
like say you're say you're at ESA or whatever conference you're at, and if you and you're out for beers afterwards, or you're out for beers, you know, your Thursday happy hour or whatever, and you look around and you only see if you if you if you only see other dudes, um, you know, you 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 one of one of the ways in which institutional sexism plays out is that, you know, those conversations that you guys all have together, it um can often be really important and there can be really cool ideas shared and maybe even you know collaborations or projects that come out of that and so so inadvertently by excluding women you know there, there are whole um, there are whole conversations that they never get to be a part of and that's sort of one of the ways in which these very completely unintentional and very subtle um, expressions can can play out um, over the long term that disadvantage someone over the course of their career just by not being around when certain conversations happen um, and so, yeah, so I think, you know, just being mindful is really important and also just taking a minute because, you know, as Bug said, there's, there's, it's not, someone's at, so someone's privately held attitude doesn't necessarily make, uh, create a, a hostile environment for, say, a, if you want to have, you know, if you want to increase diversity and you want more students of color or, or women students or whatever, um, then someone's privately held opinions don't don't create that hostile environment necessarily as, as much as the, the overt, 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 overtly spoken ones. And so we keep the talking behavior. about... Yeah, the behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we want to increase diversity in science, it's not just these really cool programs, um, you know, things like SEEDS with ESA that are important. It's also just, you know, we, we, have, we can't just rely on the fact that ESA has SEEDS and say, sweet, we're all set. We don't have to really think about this ourselves. Like, we still, we're not off the hook, right? The things that we do every day are often the things that end up, you know, contributing to the leaky pipeline in the end.